Hello, assalamu alaikum and welcome to Sisters Speak. Today we are going to be speaking about a lot of things because we have a special guest, uh, Adil Abu Taha. Uh, we're going to be speaking about entrepreneurship, ethical, ethical, just being ethical um, and building in the tech space, which Adil will talk about a bit more. But you're here with me, Sonia, and we also have me, Farin. And our guest, would you like to just say hello? Hi, assalamu alaikum. Nice to meet everyone. Lovely to meet you as well. Um, so I'm just going to give a little short introduction about Adil for those of you who don't know him. So Adil Abu Taha is a multifaceted entrepreneur and the driving force behind Boy Cat, an innovative app designed to empower consumers to make ethical shopping choices, particularly in support of Palestinian causes. Adil founded Boy Cat. I keep nearly saying boycott, sorry, <laughs> boycott and leads its development, marketing, growth and wears every hat necessary. He is joined by his talented and selfless engineers on a mission to change consumerism forever. His entrepreneurial journey began early, launching a tutoring business at 15, a clothing line at 16 and a media company at 18, where he successfully partnered with high profile brands like Audi. At 19, he founded his next project product management company. In his latest efforts to build Boycat, he was fired from his job because of his support for Palestine. So yeah, that was a great, great introduction. I think um, so many things that I want to pick on there. Um, not least the fact that you started this when you were 15 years old. Like, I don't know what you were doing at 15, Farine. I don't know what I was doing, but definitely not what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really, really impressive. So well done. Um, so... Before we actually go into it, I hope you guys don't mind, but we are going to do our thought of the week because that is something we do every radio show. So we'll just go around the circle and do that. We can start with Farine. Sure, sure. I'll go on. Um, I've just been thinking a lot about overconsumption and the fact that we always have things that we really don't need. Um, so I say, for example, like when it's Ramadan, for example, when we make iftar, there's so much food and then it goes to waste. Or when we buy things, there's just so many things that lead to overconsumption. And obviously we're spending that money and then we're doing, you know, a carbon footprint. We're like, so yeah, I've just been thinking about overconsumption and how we can, we basically can live a really simple life with simple things that we have and just, you know, yeah, it's being true. really simplistic. Yeah. I think we overconsume in so many we as do. It, like aspects of our life. Like uh, we were having like a clothing clear out in my house recently and we, I just thought, why did we even buy so, so many, many things, clothes, yeah. right? I mean, the good thing is if you do give it to charity or, you know, reuse it in some ways or, you know, secondhand clothes people buy now as well. But it's just, you know, you have to reflect and think, why was I doing all of that? Yeah. yeah. And honestly, with overconsumption, the one thing that came to my mind was my parents because everything that they have, basically, they always keep it. Oh, yeah. So, and then I was like, why, why are you keeping so much stuff? It's so old and everything. You can just throw it away. And then... I read in a TikTok comment with TikTok is like my main source of information these days. There's like a blanket of security for them because they grew up with nothing. Aww. So then the fact that it's like a different perspective on things. So whatever we think it's like useless and we don't need it. Our parents are like, no, we might need it in the future, you know. I guess there's two sides to that, isn't yeah. there? Like, do you get rid of it and buy new things or do you keep trying to like make use of something and upcycle it in some way? Um, but yeah, that was a great thought of the week. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Farine. I think it links in with our main topic as well. Um, Adi, would you like to go next? Have you got a thought of the week for us? Oh, man. I was not prepared for a thought of the week. But, I know. I think an interesting thought of the week is that I was thinking about opportunity a lot. And I think this is completely unrelated to ethical and shopping and consumerism. But more so, like, if there's an opportunity at hand, you have to take it no matter what. Because um, you never know what it's going to lead towards. Even if it's something that may seem, like, random or, like, very small. Like, if you can take the opportunity and help someone else, like, when you're doing the opportunity, then I think a lot of doors will open up in your future. Um, so that's a random yeah. thought I had. Just because it happened multiple times this past week. Oh, that's a great, great thought of the week. I think it's kind of like um, the theory of just saying yes to things that come up. Um to try and, you know, even if it doesn't seem related, like you said, it could seem something like something that's so out of your field, out of your comfort zone. But if you say yes, you don't know where it, what it might lead to and so on. So I think that is a very, very good thought of the week. Thank yeah. you for that. I, I always think about this every time because obviously I was doing law and now I'm doing computer science and it's completely 
completely unrelated to radio but i joined radio like the opportunity came up and yeah i completely agree with you i think saying yes to things opens up and you are out of your comfort zone so i it's something that i tend to do a lot and i like to do it good yeah exactly you never know where you might end up what you might yeah. enjoy you know um so lovely thank you guys both uh i had a thought of the week but mine was a bit negative compared to both of yours <laughs> so i feel like i'm gonna bring it back down but i'm just gonna say it quickly um it was just like reflecting on the kind of week and the current circumstances of my neighborhood my town the world as mm -hmm. we always do and I just thought to myself like you know I'm an my, well I'm not an immigrant but my parents were immigrants to the country and um, oftentimes we find us find ourselves yeah explaining ourselves um, as like why why we belong here why I should be here and I just I just want to say to all my people like anybody that is an immigrant or second generation or third we shouldn't ever have to explain ourselves like that's not something we have to do but personally I don't think we should do that it's exhausting um, obviously we have so many so many good things to say and so much to brag about but also at the same time we shouldn't have to do it it shouldn't be mandatory we shouldn't feel like we have to but yeah that's my thought of the week it's a bit sad compared to the other ones so let's bring the tone back up for the show today <laughs> so Adil you're our special guest and we just want to talk a little bit in the first half of the show about your entrepreneurship um, like such exciting exciting things we heard about 15 years old 16 years old 18 year old you know uh, stuff that we weren't doing at that age so right from the beginning would you like to explain what kind of inspired you what gave you the drive to start a tutoring business at the age of 15 yeah um honestly <laughs> it's really cheesy but i just wanted money um it's like that's the biggest thing <laughs> straight um and i kind of like i was able to kind of accelerate my way through school a bit so i was a bit you know a bit ahead of people my age and so I was always asked to like, you know, help them out with tutoring and help them understand like more difficult subjects. And with that, I was able to find like a little op business opportunity because at a certain point there is like, you know, five to 10 people starting to come out to me at the same day and asking for help. <coughs> and your time is limited, so you can't really always do something. So it's like, how do you filter someone out? And for me, it was simple. <laughs> I just charged a little bit of money. And then, you know, that 10 people would drop down to like five people I would pay. And then after that, you keep increasing your prices and you go from there. But I'm like, it was nice because um, just having a little bit of an accelerated path, I was able to start tutoring like more than just friends and like family um, friends. And so it evolved into something where I was tutoring like, community colleges. Um, they're called junior colleges here in America and like other college students as well, too, um, when I was in high school, just for some like calculus, go chem, bio, stuff like that. Wow. Um, and. I live in a university town, and so a lot of the professors' kids were all professor kids, which means they wanted to have a, <coughs> they wanted to have the best education possible. So they were willing to spend a crazy amount of money just to have their kids learn at like the highest level or perform at the highest level. Um, and so I just saw an opportunity there. I was like, one, I can make money. I can go buy stuff I want to buy, like random like bikes and you know toys and whatever else I wanted to, like different software stuff, com like computers and all and stuff. And then I could also like do what I really enjoy, which is teaching. Because if you could transform my entire life and money was never an issue i would be a teacher 100 percent. because i think just teaching someone and having see or seeing them have that light bulb moment where they you know understand some new concept completely like that is one of the best feelings ever i think and yeah. I, I think you can change people's lives completely as a good teacher um but unfortunately there's no money there so i'm not in the, i'm not in the teaching space yet um inshallah in the future but i saw the opportunity i saw that there was a need for it and i just kind of like put you know all these I connected the dots essentially and from there i was able to get a monopoly on everyone in the, the university town i was in and i started hiring my friends <laughs> because there's so much demand for it um and you know my friend group was I'm like a little bit accelerated as well and so we were able to basically have a monopoly and we were generating a couple thousand dollars a month at 15. wow wow i can't believe you're doing that at 15. i was i didn't tutor people you know when you do that random helping people in the classroom i should have made a business out of it as well exactly you're <laughs> right you're right we didn't have that business no we drive, didn't you know um that, that just sounds so amazing um i'm guessing you had to also stay on top of your studies even more so because now you're teaching students even you know and you need to teach them like you know you were mentioning college level stuff as well here so um how did you kind of manage that and would you say there were some challenges there that you faced I know you did mention that you and your friends were you know a bit more gifted in in education and studies as well so how what kind of challenges did you face I wouldn't say we're gifted. I just think we got the hang of things quicker, <laughs> uh, which is which is nice. I'm like the blessing. But I think when you teach someone something, you 
learn it better because you yeah, learn the most true. optimal way of you know doing whatever you're what you're, whatever you're doing so i wouldn't say it was hard like it was more so like just pay attention in class and then come back after class and then reteach it because a lot of the teachers here especially in the u.s they're not like the highest qualified qualified ones they're more so like you know simpler majors just easy get in because they just need there's a demand of teachers so it's easy to get into um so the barrier of entry is a bit lower and so they might be smart but they just don't know how to teach or they might know how to teach but not be smart um so if you combine both of those then you can basically win because you understand how people your age think for the most part and then you know just kind of go in that direction but That's in terms good of advice. My own stuff, yeah it was pretty easy i think alhamdulillah um, I hope your old teachers aren't listening, by the way, because you <laughs> just said they might, they may be smart and don't know how to teach or they know how to teach, but they're not smart. Um, but I, I do get what you're saying. I do get it. And especially like you said, your age people, you're going to understand them more than anyone, to be honest. You understand how their brain works and what concepts they're finding a bit tricky. So that does make sense. And you mentioned something about the money. I guess that's why a lot of teachers who are teachers say they do it because it's rewarding. Like it's not about the money, right? Um, but it's good to know that inshallah in the future, that's something you might return to. Um, but yeah, the second thing that we kind of looked at in your timeline was age 16, you started a clothing line. What yeah. was that? <laughs> what was that all about? <laughs> um, it was kind of a side quest that ended up becoming a main quest, I guess, in my, my story. Um, long story short, I took all the money from the tutoring. And what happens during the summer is that uh, everyone goes on vacation so your business is super low i was like i still want money to buy stuff like a camera i want to buy like all this one exciting things that were very expensive at the time for someone that's like 15 16. and um the best way to figure out how to like get money was like i was like sales of things people buy every day and people buy clothes pretty often they buy they want to have be part of a community they want to have some sort of lifestyle aspect and you know just seeing if you can go around to like a random store and then see your clothes in the store like that that'd be amazing or if you could see something that you had like that was yours in like public setting it's like really cool right because it's like everyone has some sort of association to that that brand or company and so in my head i wanted to <coughs> sorry i wanted to like create a community in a sense and then have it international so that way there was no such thing as a down season in terms of when people would buy stuff because i wanted a camera i wanted the latest like technology whatever it was um, and I wanted to like start building things that were like bigger than myself um, or like bigger than individual wants. Um, Cause if I, if I could take my parents on a vacation, like at the, that age, like that's crazy to me. Like that's something that I would yeah. read about in like, you know, news articles uh, and stuff. Even I now, I person. think, yeah. No, sorry, I was going to say even at this age, whatever age it is, if you can take your parents on a holiday or vacation, that's something to be proud of. But yeah, it, I think at 16, I, run, I mean, starting a clothing line is so unique because of the way but the way you said it you've simplified it what do people like to buy clothes where what can i do make it international so there's no down season straight like that just that makes so much sense i think we should do something like we that. should do something you make it look so easy you know <laughs> yeah. i but think then, it is once you know about how to do it so best so of luck you, on that did you have a creative flair did you have an idea in your mind when it came to the fashion industry or was it just looking at things that already sell and continue like trying to copy it um i watched a lot of youtube <laughs> and so i watched youtubers do different things and i found a niche that was like something special where it's like gym lifestyle and i think it was at the time gymshark was starting up um like a couple like maybe like a year and a half two years after they started like you know really growing and i was like if they exist in the uk i can do 10 times more <laughs> in the us but you know i was i was 16 i was pretty naive and i didn't really understand the entire industry so I basically just got in contact with a bunch of manufacturers from like China and, you know, India, Bangladesh and stuff like that um, and started just designing all the clothes myself. And I got everything shipped to my house and from my house, I would fill orders. Um, my entire garage was full. Like my, my parents had to move the cars out just so like, you know, I could have like 30 boxes of clothes in, in, in the garage at all times. Um, and they're supportive because it was all my own money anyways. I took every every single dollar from the tutoring business and I just threw it into like the clothing line. And I wanted to learn how to like distribute something like internationally. Like if I could go to like some random country in the middle of like Africa or Asia and I could see someone wearing something I made, that would feel like I accomplished something. Um, unfortunately, it never got that far because it was only within the US um, <laughs> and Canada. But alhamdulillah, I mean, like the idea was I wanted to build a community where people felt like there was a trend coming along in terms of like gym lifestyle clothing. And at the same time, they could feel like they were all improving together in terms of like the gym aspect or like health aspect. So that was my initial inspiration.
Okay, thank you. Farine, do you have any questions about that? I just, I think it's really good the fact that you had a supportive um, system behind everything. You're, even though you were spending your own money and everything like that, I think just having supportive parents, because my parents are so supportive, so I kind of like relate to you, even though I don't have any business or anything like that. But um, I think it's really good and it's really impressive that you did that at 16. Yeah, definitely. I think having a supportive family is the most everything. important thing. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Um, would you say that that helped you as well, Adil, having that supportive system? Yeah, of course. I mean, I was a second born, so I wasn't under the pressure of you have to go to like med school, engineer, lawyer type of thing. So I got to be the rebellious kid. Um, I was still on the track for pre-med, but I was able to experiment just a little bit before. And then I was able to showcase like what I can do because I don't like I had the opportunity. Um, yeah. But yeah. How about you? What were you guys doing at 16? Okay. That's a good question. Very I was finishing high school, you know, just enjoying, you know, that uh, like prom parties and stuff like that. I was definitely not thinking about any businesses or making money. I was just spending my parents' money left and right. Love that for you. Um, I don't think money was a big factor in my life, as in it didn't exist, which is sad. <laughs> and I'm sure I wanted it often. But um, we had a very like, close-lit neighborhood, which is good because then me and my friends used to just go out to just be in each other's houses or go to the local post office and buy like 10p sweets um 10p is like 10 cents by the way I think I don't know but um yeah I think again I was just finishing school as well and then funnily enough my first job was being a tutor um but I didn't make a business out of it I just worked for other people sadly um but yeah thank you for asking us we are now going to talk about because um we've got so many things to talk about with you Adil like we can go on all day I think you also started a media company then at 18 right yeah alhamdulillah alhamdulillah Um, so would you like to talk a little bit about that yeah yeah of course um I mean the thing I learned with the clothing line was that distribution is king in any b2c business and I think that (coughs) you can have the best product but if you don't know how to market it then you know, you wouldn't sell anything. Like if you could, mm-hmm. you could have literally the best thing in existence. But you know, the more people that you can reach, the better it is, and the more people that can see it, the better chance that someone can buy your buy your clothes, right? And I didn't understand that. I didn't understand how influencers worked because I knew influencers were a thing, and they were like rising up in the industry where, you know, now they're like the, they're like, a, like the dream job of like millions of people. But at the time, I was like, they are a source of marketing, but like, can we actually do something with them? And I kind of like did, I didn't succeed with the clothing line. Like obviously, others I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't be building all the stuff I'm building now. But I learned a lot, and I think that was like the most valuable lesson. And so what I did was I took that information. I was like, what am I missing to make it successful? And I wanted to start something that would help me learn all the right skills. And in that case, it was media. And I loved like I love photography and videography as a whole already. And so I was like, I can make a business out of this. Um, and that just seemed like the mentality. I was like, how can I provide or how can I self sustain my hobbies? And um, started starting the basic stuff of like <clears throat> grad photo shoots and then go, went to weddings and then after weddings, did some car shoots. And then from there, like, <coughs> I think just having a wide portfolio helped me like connect to the right people. I started seeing like some of the things I was doing and, you know, started connecting with brands and doing ad- advertisements, um, digital media for them, digital content, helping them with launches. Uh, started learning about analytics a lot and like the, the right storytelling. I think that's one thing I learned the most, which is just storytelling, like, how can you tell a story that's so engaging that people want to be a part of it or they want to learn? Um, and how do like, I think the lessons have uh, persisted over the years in that. Alhamdulillah. And were you, so you were 18, uh, just going back to, obviously you mentioned you were in pre-med or on the track for pre-med. Was that continuing on the side or did you put that to, uh, to a halt now and say, okay, I want to focus on my businesses and focus on this media company that I'm making? No, I wasn't allowed to skip any, any school oh, at all. Um, Cause my parents are like, at school I, I wasn't allowed to drop out or anything i agree but, i agree um, <laughs> i don't agree <laughs> um, we'll come back but, to that but yeah we'll definitely come back to it but i'm like I, I was able to finish high school at 17 and then i was i hated school so much i wanted to like you know figure out some way to like just do business and um since i was allowed to drop out the only solution for me was to finish as fast as possible so how i was able to finish like college when i was like 19 um and our pre-med is slightly different. So for us, it's four years undergrad, four years med school, and then four years in residency. Then you can become a doctor, like officially. Um, I think it's considered like a consultant in the UK or something. Like that's what you have to do for our normal process. Um, and I was watching my brother go, go through med school and I was like, there's no way I'm doing this because he's a doctor. And I'm like, you know, he's, he's the favorite child, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but, good for um, him. <laughs> but for me, I was like, I'm not wasting 13, 14 years of my life just trying to like, mm-hmm. You know, become a doctor and have an impact on the world. I wanted to have it like right away, um, yeah. which I guess is the Gen Z problem of instant gratification, right? And so 
I wanted to like but make if sure. If you knew that that's not what you want to do, then you can't force yourself to go through it because you're just going to be unhappy and it's not going to be worth it in the end is it because you're the one that has to live with that you're the one that has to make a career out of it so I mean I hope so and I think you did make the right decision and like you oh, said yeah. your brother's doing it like good for him he can crack on and you can do something <laughs> else <laughs> yeah yeah exactly what did you so guys on the... in in college or uni so so you didn't go to further education or did you go into further education I went to uni yeah um I finished it I'm not but yeah i i don't use my degree <laughs> right okay but okay so on the media company then a question i did have was did you want to keep building it up and if so did you see competition how were you able to handle that and still kind of make money from your business yeah um there was a ton of competition at the time i think that's when the travel youtubers started like really blowing up where they started like traveling the world <laughs> recording videos for like different countries and tourism industries and they got the deals way easier than i did um, so it was more so of like, I didn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to go on vacation and go to the nicest places and record stuff. And so I had to make the most of what I could in my own industries. And so that's why a lot of local brands, like I was very lucky to get like Audi as like a company, um, brand, and like just doing a shoot with them, which was a lot of fun, but it wasn't like anything crazy. And so at the time, because I was in, you know, in school, basically full time, like 6am to like 8pm basically every day, um, I didn't have as much time as I wanted to and I couldn't travel as much as everyone else did. And so I had to like make decisions. Right. And so during that time I had to end up not going, not completely shutting it down, but making that like the tough choice of like, I have to like dial back and then figure something else out. Cause I can't do this for the next two years basically. So. Yeah. And how did you get the Audi thing? I mean, you said it's not a big deal, but that's, that's a huge, huge deal. That's amazing. Um, you just, you just got to post, I think building in public, even for like something as simple as photography, videography and showing people what you can do and doing it for free. And then eventually someone, someone sees, someone knows someone that sees something and then they're like, Hey, I like this idea who made it. And then they reach out to someone and eventually you get in contact with them. And then you kind of just like, you know, get, yeah. get a deal done or an opportunity done. It goes back to the opportunity. Just take every opportunity possible. Yes. And also, I like the phrase that was like, someone knows someone that sees something, <laughs> because it's true. It's uh, what we always say. It's not about what you know. It's about who, who you, know. you know. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's about both. We do. We have established that as well. But a lot of the times your network is, I hate this phrase, but your network is your network. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. It's about who you know, right? I mean, it's distribution. The more people you know, the more important people you know, the better chance you have of winning. It's true. Yeah. And just putting yourself out there, like you mentioned. Um, but yeah. And then the last thing we want to speak about in the first kind of half is, and then at the age of 19, product management company. So you now, this is now officially, I guess you could say like your fourth company that you opened up while you're still under the age of 20. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I call it a company. I call it a business because company sounds big. <laughs> this is just more yeah. like a business. Um but this is like my first company, I think, where <coughs> we were bringing in a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, basically. Um, and that was like exciting. Just so, casually. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> when you know how much money is out in the world and you know how many successful people there are, like that's not that's not much. Um, but alhamdulillah, I think the really cool part was like being able to um, just teach myself everything that I needed to know about tech because I was I was in I was a pre-med right and so a lot of my knowledge was in like science and like research data marketing and analytics and media from like my past experiences and so I didn't really understand how to develop I didn't know how to build a product from zero to one like I could not tell you how to like build discord or how to build snapchat or like you know instagram or anything like that um, but I had to teach myself and I had to teach myself a lot of the data analytics to understand people because people are very like general like they're very very basic um so once you understand like the general population of like 80 percent of people you can build something that you know 80 percent of people will like you can't ever please everyone so i mean like it's impossible to do that or and there's no cho like no reason to so as long as you like can please like the 80 percent of like average people like you can build a winning product and so what we did was we basically partnered <laughs> sorry it's okay we partnered with other startups in the bay area and we just started building out past mvp level so they had like a very base product they were going on to raise. And what we did was we integrated with like them and we built out different products for them, different features. And a lot of the data analytics uh, were involved. Um, and I think that was like really fun and cool because we were successful only because we were outcome focused versus output focused. So when you're outcome focused, it basically means like you're problem solving. And then when you're output focused, you're just building a ton of stuff right away. 
Um, I think a lot of companies like fail at that because they can put out like a hundred features, but if only like 20 people use them, it's like, it's kind of a waste of time and resources. But if you're solving like one or two problems and like 90% of your user base, like goes, suffers through them, like, you know, you're building a winning product. So yeah, that's a little bit about the company itself. Thank you. What are your thoughts on that, Farin? Wow, such a, you're such a business-minded uh, person. You know, when you put a new perspective, like anything that we think, for example, we're that, we're, I feel like we're part of that 80% that we just <laughs> look for the basic things and just download any basic apps. We're the consumers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine as yeah, well. Yeah. You know, we need to make you money. Um, but yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. I think uh, we are coming towards like the first end of the first half, but it'd be interesting to know who's the we, because you speak a lot about we, we, we. Like you must have a good team behind you because you also kind of all have the same vision as well it's very hard sometimes I think to find people that are on the same wavelength and kind of get get you so who are these people um I, I say we a lot just because it's like a habit of company and like I think yeah. leadership and this doesn't necessarily mean there's always someone behind me but we as a, as a company is it can also be an individual I think um okay. so for me it was just myself at this, at, for the longest time and then I wow. ended up hiring some of my friends and then that's how it kind of happened that's really good, really good. And it's good to know that you have friends that you feel like are capable of also working with you because that's a whole other thing as well. Um, but yeah, we are going to just kind of move on to the second half. Sorry, that was the timer. And so, yeah, in the second half, we're going to talk a little bit more about ethical building and the Boy Cat app. OK, um, but before we go into it, I'm just going to ask you like a general question because we've spoken a lot about the businesses you have built and all kind of there's a lot of effort that have gone into them and they're all kind of in different fields and industries. So it, it's interesting to know, like if you had failures and setbacks in your in your ventures, like how have you managed to handle them? Well, how have you managed to say, actually, no, I'm going to carry on and going to make this new thing and I'm going to have this new idea? Like what pushes you? How do you come back from a failure? Um. The world keeps spinning no matter what. <laughs> like that that's the reality. Like the world will keep will leave you behind if you just get stagnant and like stuck on something that kind of goes wrong. And so I don't know. I don't think that there's ever really a failure or anything really bad. It's more of like there's a silver lining of a lesson. I think that <laughs> just something Islamically that I kind of like picked up as well too. There's like there's always going to be some sort of silver lining or lesson in every scenario that you're in. And if it looks like a failure, that means there's some big lesson you have to learn so that way you can prepare yourself for the next one. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, the, the world keeps spinning. Like, that's really your reality. Like, life will go on. It's not the end of the world. Um, just keep building something new. I think that's a really good mindset to have. And it's something that my dad always told me when I was young. And he always told me, like, whatever you say, whatever you make, like, you know, the world keeps spinning and everyone's also, like, developing and growing. So no one really cares about your mistakes or whatever you're doing. The important thing is, you know, get back up from them. Yeah. Wow. But do you guys think that sometimes it's just difficult? Because it is it is it's so difficult honestly and i'm the type of person that gets stuck on things for so long and i'm like overthinking it so much we always talk about this i'm mm -hmm. such an overthinking uh overthinker i'm such an overthinker and i always think about my mistakes and i never really that's why i have my parents especially my dad he's always you know telling me like it's fine you, you as long as you keep going yeah so really grateful for my dad <laughs> Yeah. Hello. Stay informed, entertained and engaged. Check out our new website inspirefm.org. So we're just going to carry on um the second half of our show as I mentioned about ethical building and the boycat app. Um would you like to just explain to us what the app is actually about? Yeah, uh the the most fun way to call it is it's an ethical shopping companion it's just like a friend that kind of tags along and provides you information on like what you're buying and what you should be buying instead based on your values um that's the simplest way of putting it i think okay that's great um farine if you like did you manage to look at the app earlier today i did i downloaded the app it's really good actually mashallah i and uh, i haven't been able to use it because i haven't been to a grocery store or supermarket i don't know what you call it in america i uh, haven't been able to use it but i did look through it and i think it's really worth thought and i also um you know i is it is the your logo based on the cats that you have that's something yeah. i've heard <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> yeah so i think it's really good yeah go on not, yeah i think it's like a fun brand and it's it's supposed to be as fun as possible where it's seamless and then that way you can make the right decisions you want to um just based on whatever you value in the future inshallah so did you have um something in mind like when you when you started the journey of creating it and so on was there some kind of would you i want to say like 
no, I don't think the word is non-negotiables, but like some certain aspects in mind where you're like, I need to make sure that's on my app. Um, I think the biggest thing was to empower people. And I needed to make sure like I could do that in every scenario. I didn't want to be someone that just dictates someone of like what they should and shouldn't do. But more so like, can I provide you the right information at the right time in your purchasing journey that your habit would change? And I think that's like the really cool part. Because the, the way I see it is that we wanted to solve three problems. First, get a ton of information and ignore me like media cycles, whatever. So like whatever social cause you care about, we can allow you to get information on like that cause itself. And the second would be like, once you know what you should be avoiding, what can you buy and what alternatives and what ethical products can we start platforming as well? And the third part was more so like, how do we incentivize someone? Because for example, if you have a normal habit of buying a certain product every single like week, like three times a week, it's really hard to get off the habit. <laughs> like how about we have Ramadan and stuff, so it's easier for like Muslims in general, but it's still a habit, like thing that we have to break, right? And so I think that's why I wanted to like build within the app and it's slowly being teased and slowly being built, but also building a community in that sense. Cause it's like, it's always easier to break habits and like try new things when there's a large group of people that are also doing the exact same thing you are. Like it's almost, it's always easier. Like Ramadan's always easier because we're all suffering together, <laughs> you know, like yeah, we're all passing yeah. together like long hours. Um, but when it's only just you, it's, it feels like it's like, you know, the end of the world type of thing. So that's yeah. what I want to em em like embody within the app itself. No, I think you're right. I think um, the kind of movement of a lot of us being more aware of where our clothes come from or if the organization behind the clothes, you know, manufacturers are also involved in things that we don't agree with, you know, we're all more aware of that now. Or we try to be more aware, right? Like we do research. And because, like you said, everyone's doing it together, you you don't feel like left out. You feel included. And we all we all want to be included, right? Um, because I will I will mention that I think this kind of I hate to say it, but like I, we went through a phase maybe of doing this about four or five years ago as well I do, right so like it happens every now and then or there, there may be other reasons like we might say oh we don't like the factories that they source their clothes from or there, there's many reasons and people do have these phases where they do it but then due to any reason it could be money it could be convenience it could be I literally can't find any other store to shop from and that was the only place that had the thing that I needed then we go back into our own pat old patterns and the same ways that we were in before. So I think this app, like you said, to, to be able to provide alternatives and, and have that social kind of, we're all in this together vibe. You know, we hold each other accountable a little bit too, don't we? Like, hold on, hold on, don't do that. Wait a minute, let me check the app. Yeah, I've got this, you should have it too. So I think that was a really, really, really good skip, like part of the app, I would say. Um, so some questions about the building of it. You built the app in public. Um, what were some of the challenges that you faced while building it in public? And why did you choose to do it in public? Um, marketing. <laughs> That's like a simple <laughs> solution. It, it's distribution, right? Like, <laughs> I'm sure there's probably like 50 apps out there right now that are trying to do the same thing. But we just do it best because we build in public and we have the market share now. And so it's easiest for us because like, it's fun just like, telling people like what you're doing and like sharing the journey of like actually building something. But at the same time, you also get very early feedback. So you're able to experiment really fast on like different features you're building out. You can validate things way quicker. Um, and it's just like, you know, every time you basically tweet about it, every time you make a TikTok about it, Instagram post, whatever it is, you have an influx of new people that are trying the app just because like they see that so many people are already on it and they see that this person is building it in public, which means like it's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be really cool just like be on that journey of like building something with that or be on the journey of watching someone build something so mm -hmm. that's like the fun part the, the part that sucks is that there are, there's a 10 percent people like a population that just expects it to be perfect right at the get-go um and like there's a lot of hate that comes with it i mean like alhamdulillah it's like it's good because that means it doesn't make you ever like complacent or stagnant because it's like yeah there's always something to improve and you can always make it way better so it's nice yeah Haters are the motivators, right? That's the thing. <laughs> um, I mean, that was going to be my next question. If you like, if you have haters, and how do you deal with them? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, always. If you look through my DMs, there's probably like 30, 40 people right now. Um, that means you're doing well, though, I suppose. Yeah, of course. I mean, any feedback is good feedback, and any publicity is good publicity. So, good and bad, it all works out in the end. What your thoughts on that, Farin? I don't know. You know what the thing is because I have I don't have any haters or anything like that, and I don't really know. I think <laughs> I think um 
I actually don't know. I can't believe having 30, 40 people hate what I'm doing. Like, mm. I can't even imagine it. And even though there's only 30, 40 people, I feel like there is a little bit of pressure, right? Yes no? and no. <laughs> I think just because, like, the community is so large now, over, like, half a million people, like, a couple hundred people that are hating on me, like, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. The good outweighs the bad, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, always. And I think that a lot of people just don't see the long-term play. Like, it's not, it's not a short-term play where this will be a trend and it dies out in like, you know, a month or two, but it's more so like, <clears throat> where will I be in like four or five years? Will they still be in my DMs? And then, or will they like, you know, just be like hating their own lives type of thing? Or like, will they be building too? Cause like most people only hate cause like they can't build something as good. So it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good mindset to have. Um, so this is like a positive thing now. What advice would you give to other app developers who want to focus on ethical building? Um, validate information and distribution is king i keep saying this because it's so important like you can have the best app ever you could create like the next instagram that's like a million times better but instagram has better marketing they have more market share they're just out there already so it's really hard to compete so building public is a great way to like build connections and get opportunities because i won't be on this podcast slash like radio show unless i was building in public and someone found me and then they reached out you know um, yes, and then likewise, like I went, I went up spoken at Muslim Tech Fest. I went to, you know, travel the world basically to different places to talk about this. Um, I went to be part of like the Muslim Accelerator in SF. So building in public, taking every opportunity, like that's like what you have to do. And ninety nine percent of ideas fail. Like you can, you have to like acknowledge that. Like your idea is probably not going to work out, but you just got to keep trying, and like the world keeps spinning, you know. Oh, we love it. We love we it. We love that. Sentence, I think we should yeah. title the show "Just the World Keeps." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, that is really good. So you've spoken a lot about distribution and marketing. Um, I have to ask: Was there ever a marketing decision that didn't go as you planned it? And if so, what did you kind of learn from it? Yeah, like every week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always trying everything. I, I'm trying everything new, like almost every week, just because, like, when you're at early stage, it's so important. <laughs> to like try everything possible because you never know what's going to work out for you. Um, mm -hmm. It could be something as simple as like a Reddit post. It could be something as simple as like a TikTok series that just catches like, you know, catches like the trend or whatever. Um, and if you just do this exact same thing every single time, people get bored and like people's attention spans are super short nowadays. So you yeah. have to like keep trying new things and, you know, be as exciting as possible whenever you can. Okay. So, so the answer to that question is you regularly face failure, but you're, with with marketing but it's something that you just keep trying new things yeah always you just gotta keep trying something new if it fails that's really really good and on the marketing we have to ask now in terms of ethical consumption as well what kind of like strategies do you think are most effective um <laughs> just being to genuine, genuine. <laughs> being genuine on on okay. social media like you have to put yourself out there and you have to like find the risk of putting yourself out there but if as long as you're very genuine people can tell like you can put up a front or a character and people can easily see it. Like you're not, you're not slick trying to like, you know, mask something or do something faceless, like be as genuine as possible. And people will like fall in love with like the founder itself versus like the product. And then whatever you end up doing, whatever you end up building, whether it's this thing or something else, like they'll fall along too. I think that's the most important part, building a community. Yeah. And I think all of the base honesty and the intention, I think the intention behind your app and the intention behind what you're doing is really important. It's something that obviously, you know, Allah is also watching. So that's what that you're going to get the better from that. So I think that's really important. Like the honesty and the intention that you're doing it. That's the most important part. That's where you're going to inshallah be successful, successful in the future. Inshallah. That's actually funny you brought that up because I was telling this to someone the other day. But basically, whenever my intentions are really good and really pure, like I just want to yeah. help people out. We have a great week in signups. Like everything goes well. But then, like, the one, like, because I have to realign my intentions every week, basically. Um, and then the week I have, I'm like, oh, I can make a lot of money off this. Like, this this, this has potential to be, like, a billion-dollar, like, you know, industry. We have a terrible week in signups. <laughs> we have a terrible <laughs> week in, like, user growth and all that stuff. And it, it's just a good reminder, like, as long as you're doing stuff for, like, the right reason, like, Allah is going to provide you. Like, you don't have to worry about it, right? Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's interesting really you brought good. it up. Yeah, and... Sorry, yeah no i it's just an intention and uh having the right intention behind anything you do i think is so so important it's something that you learn i don't think you you just you know when you were 15 for example what the intention behind it was you know get sales out of it and stuff like that but once you go up i feel like you realize that that's not the important thing and the important thing behind your app for example it's not obviously there's also a business side of it and you have yeah, a sales side yeah. of it but just helping out people and you know doing something that aligns with your values is so so important 
Yeah, hundred um, percent. So the question I have now is, and you might have answered it actually, both of you together. But um, how do you stay motivated and true to your principles and the ethical principles in in this kind of competitive market that exists? Um, who wants to answer that first? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, I mean, I'm I mean, not... you're a special, right? You, you've been working in marketing. I can answer, you can answer that. that question. Hmm, that's interesting. I, I think I'm still on the journey, so I haven't really had to have that kind of moral dilemmas or anything like that. Um, but I think it's, it's about being genuine again, because I feel like everything you do, like it'll come back in a way that's like either very positive or very negative and nothing is worth it. I think that is something that I can hold on to because so many times we see maybe like you know a great successful brand or a successful person if we're talking about influencing and so on but like giving away those kind of you know practices that you hold tight to you and those principles you know it'll only come back and bite you bite yourself in the back like literally forget anybody else you're the one that has to live with it and think oh god why did I do that why did I put myself out there like that yeah so I think that is something that kind of I just remind myself I don't think it's worth it ever in the end because you have to live with it right um but yeah you guys can go next and nobody's allowed to copy my answer <laughs> <laughs> I think either you can go next I don't think I have any experience in this field to be honest um I think there's like three parts it's right off the top of my head the first is intention that we talked about already like as long as your intentions are good like you'll see success and if they're bad you won't see success like you won't even get far enough to make the decision of like ethical or non-ethical decision if your intentions are bad the second part I think is that if you just have like this trust in Allah it's like hey, everything will work out like no matter what so you know every time it I think I said this multiple times in different like podcasts and stuff but it's like it takes more effort to sin um, like that's the reality it's like if you wanted to steal or if you wanted to like do something or scam someone it takes more effort to do that than just do the right thing because yeah. um, inherently we have the right thing built into us and so that's the second part and the third part I think is just like when you really want something like this goes back more into want than like trying to like decide if you should do the right thing or not but if you really want something and it's good like you can wake up for a thousand every night for it. So unless you like, if you don't truly want something, you won't be able to wake up. But if you really want something, you'll wake up every single night for a for it. And why would you kind of like dirty that goal, or like whatever your really want is by doing something like that's unethical in a sense. Like you're talking to God about it in like the best time of like, you know, any point in prayer. And then you're still going to choose something to do, like do something bad, right? Or like underhanded or like backstabbing type of thing. So I don't know. I think, it's not worth it <laughs> if you can have a conversation with God and still do something bad. It's just probably not something you should be doing in the first place. So those are yeah. my three points. That was really, really good. Uh, I think you made a good point there again. And it, it kind of brings back that kind of guilt that you have to live with yourself because it's like, like you said, you're you're talking to God about this. You're in conversation every night, you know, trying to make this happen. And then you're going to do something that you doesn't align with your morals or values. And then you're the one that has to live with it. So, yeah, I, th I think that's a great answer that you gave there because all three of your points mentioned faith. So would you say that kind of your faith has not just you know kept you aligned with your morals and so on but also has it been a big driving factor in your businesses and now with the boycott app would you say that it has been yeah i mean it's it's the foundation and pillar right of everything that we do um and for me i mean like literally it could have been any one of the two billion muslims in the world that built this app it could have been a non-muslim too like it could have been anyone but i was chosen because you know whatever reasons i needed to and there's certain skills and, and tools and resources i have that would make it work and i'm not like i'm able to acknowledge that and because of that it's like i'm only able to acknowledge that because of like how islam is in my life right now and like you know if you gave me this app like five years ago it probably wouldn't be the same so i'm not i mean like it's all a journey and i think islam is like a pillar and if you do things the most islamic the most pure way it's like you'll see a lot of success in that way yeah, I, can, I think based off your thought of the week as well, God gave you the opportunity. The fact is, how are you going to use that opportunity, take it to your advantage to do something that God has showed you basically how to do it? Yeah. Great, great points, guys. Thank you for that. And I think it was a, a really nice thing that you just said that if you try and make, when you enact anything, whatever it is, a project or, you know, something at home with your family, if you do it the most Islamic way, you're going to get the most success and you're probably going to get the most happiness as well and the most rewards, be it Islamically or just a rewarding feeling as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. Um, Farid? Yes. 
Would you like to ask Adil a little bit more? I feel like we've been very um, interview, interview kind of thing. That's because we have so many questions. Um, our whole team, you know, have been looking into this uh, boycott app and that's why we're so excited as well. So we haven't really been just asking you some general personal questions. Is there anything that comes to mind, Farine? Anything that comes to mind now? Let's see. Um, so what are you doing now? Like, what's the base of what you're doing now? Um, it's less development work and it's more managing work. Um, okay. And it involves a lot of traveling because I just have to meet a lot of people, meet the right people, build relationships, and then inshallah, like you know, expand this app and, and into something that becomes like a the new new Gen Z consumer product. Basically, like, that's my goal in the long run, where we can support as many causes as possible, change different economy, economies around the world, and like really influence how people spend money. Um, so inshallah, we can do it in the right way as long as our intentions inshallah. are good. Yeah, and, and let us just speak now because we're always happy, you know, across the pond to support you and you to support us as well. I'm sorry, where are you based, by the way? I heard you say Bay Area earlier on. So is that like California? Yeah, yeah. So so I live in Los Angeles area, but I also go up to the Bay Area near San Francisco like every week. So I fly back and forth. Nice, nice. We live in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what part of the UK? <laughs> like the we live in UK. <laughs> I'll send you my documentary. I made a documentary about Luton. So yes, she did. It's actually thing. really, really good. You'll see an insight into where we live. We're very, very close, small community of Luton. Yeah. Um, but Farine is actually from Spain. Yeah, yeah. I, I was. Yeah, I was born in Spain. I grew up in Spain. I moved to the UK about five years ago. So oh, it's it's been oh, a journey. Why'd you leave? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to give you some lightheartedness because I feel like we've had a very, you know, interview, interview-esque kind of show today. But we wanted to because we wanted to know so much about you, Adil. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I think before we end, I just it'd be nice if we can get like a personal story that highlights the impact of your app and the whole ethical consumption because it is such an amazing app. Um, we will, you know, put it in the details of the show as well, the Boycat app. But if you would love to tell us a personal story about either how you led to that or the process of or of you doing it right now, it'd be great. Um, I don't know if I have anything like life changing, <laughs> but there are some very touching moments that kind of make all like the struggles, all the hate, all like the, you know, sleepless nights kind of worth it. Mm -hmm. um, just because every so often you get a DM message from someone from Palestine and they're the ones going through like whatever the current situation is and they kind of just tell you thank you and like that and like they're making do out for you and like that kind of makes everything worth it because all I think all it takes is like you only need one do in the world that is accepted that is like make this person go to Jannah and, like that's like you know that's like the, the dream goal of a lot of people trying to like build anything it's like you have an impact so that way someone can make do out for you um and I think seeing that kind of happen I can I obviously like I I know their duas are accepted. So I think inshallah I'll be in a good place <laughs> in the future. <laughs> but um just having some of those DMs and messages from people that I'm act I'm actively impacting, I think that helps me like be motivated and it kind of like is that life changing moment where it's like I know I chose the right decisions in whatever I did. Yeah, that is amazing. That I think that would make anybody's day, do you know what I mean? But for you, even like you said, their duas inshallah will be accepted inshallah. and if they're making dua for you, like, <clears throat> what more can you ask for, right? What more can you ask for? That That's a lovely person story. And I think that's a lovely way to end our show today. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Adil, for being on the show. It was so, so lovely to talk to you. I think we could have another show because there's so many things that we'd love to know, especially on the business side, right? I think Yes, we, we need some advice from you. We need yeah. to start up a business now. <laughs> we do. We need to make $100,000 yes, and say that it's casual. Yeah. Um, and there's the timer for our show. So that's it. Thank you all for listening. And Adam, would you like to say bye to our listeners and viewers? Thank today? you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, it wasn't too boring. But, uh, no, no, definitely not. Boring. Thank you. And we'll hopefully see you again soon. Assalamu alaikum to all the Sister Speak listeners. Bye. Bye bye.